has not already been well documented. Who would like to come in first? Um, anyone? Imogen? Sorry, um, I, I wonder if you could just clarify exactly what you mean by the question. I wasn't quite sure what you're... Okay, what you, what so you're did, did the SEND <laughs> review reveal anything new about the SEND system uh, that was not already well documented? Ah, okay. Um, no, I, I, I don't think it revealed anything new in terms of some of the difficulties that are there um, inherent in the system. Um, although I think some of the... Uh, the suggestions and recommendations that um, that, that that have been set out um, uh, 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 seem to do seem to go off a, 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 on a on a slightly different tangent to some of the um, kind of recommendations that that we were talking about possibly two years ago when we were um, you know when we were looking at these things um, uh, some time ago. So so I think that. That the, the problems aren't new, but some of the suggestions for dealing with them um, ha have gone off in a sort of different direction. Any other thoughts from any of the other witnesses, Mr. King? Yeah, I'm slightly puzzled by um, one of the things that wasn't in the review. Um, we, we've had, as you know from the evidence I gave last time, um, we've had a long-standing role in dealing with complaints from parents about um, the development and delivery of um, support for children with special educational needs. But there's really no reference whatsoever to our role in the review, even though the review focuses a great deal on redress. So I was very surprised by that, um, particularly by a particular section which says that they intend to set standards for how complaints related to send processes and provision will be dealt with and who's responsible for resolving those concerns. Um, that raised a real question for me about whether the department intends to introduce changed or alternative um, complaint mechanisms. It's certainly not something they've spoken to us about. I was partly reassured when I heard a department official speak into the Public Accounts Committee where they said they didn't um, envisage a change to our role. But even that doesn't really address some of the key issues about jurisdiction, which I know the committees has uh, written to the department about before, and we've certainly spoken to the department about. I think it also fails to understand the role we already have statutorily in setting complaint standards around this area and, and others. So I was left rather puzzled by the references to complaint handling in the review because they don't seem to fit with the, the reality on the ground at the moment. And uh, um, Ali? Yes, I mean, I, I would say I would agree with, with both of those uh, points that have been made. I think that the, the, the Green Paper seems to be based on a misconception that local variation is permitted in terms of, of, the, of the legal framework. And in fact, it is not. There is a very clear national legal framework for meeting the needs of children and young people with SEND. The problem is that actually local authorities regularly disregard their legal duties, um, but they don't actually have any local discretion. So the suggestion actually that there is, you know, uh, local systems operating and, and, and uh, and, and then that's, that is the problem, is, is um, very misplaced, I think. It's based on a, on a fundamental misconception. Thank you. Marino? Yeah, and, and just, just to build on that, I think that the, the, the legal framework is consistent um, nationally. However, we know that, that there is huge variation in um, how needs are assessed and met and the services that are available. Um, and, and at the moment, it, it's, it, it is overwhelmingly poor. And I think that the key thing that, that for, for me that we need to drive at is why is there that variation at the minute and why is the, the, the consistent legal framework that Ali refers to not consistently applied? What are the incentives and the motivations of system leaders that mean that, they, um, uh, that there is this variation? And what is then the accountability that we can bring to bear when we see that variation and, and, and children's and families' needs aren't met, how do we then actually fix that problem? And, and, and for me, those, those, I think, and for our members, those are the two key issues in the sense of what's gone wrong with the incentivization, the motivation in the system, which means that needs are not being met consistently. And secondly, why has the redress system, why has the accountability system failed to, to, to correct that? So the, and that's the, that's, that's the issue that we need to, we need to try that. So the review um, acknowledges the, um, 
that the fact that it's an incredibly difficult system for parents to uh, navigate. Um, it says, for, for too many families, their experience of the centre system is bureaucratic and adversarial rather than collaborative. In your experience, uh, what are the main reasons why the SEND system is bureaucratic and adversarial? Um, please, I'll, I'll start with you, Ali, this time. Sure, I, I think this is, I mean, it is fundamentally picking up on really what Marina was saying, because local authorities fail to comply with the law, and that is to do with the fact that there is not a sufficiently robust accountability framework in place that, that incentivizes or forces local authorities to change their behaviour. Um, and I think actually what needs to be tackled is, is, is that fundamental problem. So rather than, than looking at how you reduce routes of redress for parents, um, actually what needs to be tackled is, is how you improve decision making um, and, and ensure that that decision making is lawful. Uh, and that is the root of the problem. And I think, you know, what the SEND review seems to have done is to have completely disregarded the overwhelming evidence that the biggest problem within the same system is the lack of accountability and a failure, particularly on the part of local authorities, to comply with the law, um, you know, at the most basic level. Um, and I think, you know, no one should underestimate the significance of the proposals in this green paper and the extent to which they are going to entail a complete overhaul of the current SEND law framework to the detriment of children, young people with special educational needs and disabilities. And um, I don't think that is fully grasped. I think that it's about having to read between the lines. And um, I think it's a wolf in sheep's clothing. Um, just, just before I come into the, 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 uh, uh, to the other witnesses, I mean, do, you, do you think that, I mean, what, what targeted support would you all propose to support disadvantaged children with the SEND who face additional challenges during the during the, the pan pandemic? And do you think that it went far enough to acknowledge the specific uh, barriers faced by disadvantaged pupils? I mean, from our perspective, I think what we've seen since the start of the pandemic is the deepening of the crisis in SEND provision. But actually, the, the, the pandemic hasn't created new problems. It, it has exacerbated those that already existed. Uh, and we have long been very concerned at Ipsy about some particular groups of children who experience additional disadvantage, including those who are in the care system, those who are in criminal detention and migrant children. And I think the one hope that I suppose I have is that um, if there is going to be legislative change, and there de very definitely is, that there might be an opportunity to perhaps influence and improve the um, rights and entitlements of some of those more disadvantaged groups. And Amun Munal? Yeah, so so the the, the let's let's be clear, the SEND system was um, failing before the pandemic. The pandemic doubled down on 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 those disadvantaged kids. So um, it's really clear that um, the, the, the the lack of services, the disruption services during the pandemic exacerbated existing harms. So we've got lots and lots and lots of evidence of children who have gone backwards in their learning um, have um, ended up with significantly worse physical conditions, um, for example, through missing physiotherapy. Um, we, and we also have lots and lots of evidence um, of new harms that resulted as a result of the pandemic itself. Um, and you know, I don't need. To, I'm sure you're all across the the anxiety, the mental health issues, the socialisation issues that many children are facing as a result of um, isolation. The other thing I think it's really important to say is that I, I'm now back biting people's heads off. If, if somebody tells me that we're back to normal, we are categorically not back to normal when it comes to our families, because services are under huge amounts of pressure and again you all read the newspapers you're all aware of this but particularly community health services we're seeing as uh, to, to quote one of our members the other day we're facing a, a tsunami of unmet needs now and we're seeing a backlog that services aren't able to catch up with and then on top of that you've got the exacerbated harms that uh, and, and then you've got the, the the new cases that have come and so we're seeing a lot of our families are really, really struggling. So we are nowhere near back to normal after the pandemic when it comes to SEND families. And Michael. 
In, t in terms of um, the impact of, of COVID, I would echo exactly what the two previous witnesses have said. We, we produced a report um, earlier this year which looked at 500 investigations we've carried out into COVID-related cases, including many in this sector. Um, what we found was that the kind of problems with, which you'll be familiar with, where local authorities didn't properly record the way in which they tried to comply with their reasonable endeavours duty that was introduced in that time. Local authorities sometimes failed to communicate well with parents around which parts of the plan would be sustained during that period and which wouldn't. We found evidence that uh, sometimes local authorities failed to take a proper risk assessment of what they could and couldn't deliver during that period and failed to make, uh, keep proper records of that. So we found some specific problems to do with um, COVID itself, but I would absolutely echo what um, what my colleagues have said there, which is that um, our experience of looking at COVID investigations very much um, suggests that that um, amplified problems and stresses that were already in the system. So delays that existed were made worse. Um, administrative weaknesses were there were made worse. So COVID didn't introduce something new. It simply put a a microscope on um, existing fractures and problems in the system. Mm -hmm. And did you want me to comment as well on the issue about um, conflict and, and yeah, the adversarial and nature? Just, just briefly, if I could, because we've got lots to get to, ask yep. you all very gently to be as concise as possible. Um, but uh, carry on. Yeah, I mean, to, in terms of the question about conflict, um, I agree very much with what Ali said. I, I think the focus on redress suggests that the problem is at the end of the system and there's too much conflict at the end. There's only conflict at the end of the system because it's not working upstream. And I think if there's any kind of um, impression here that the, the, the problem to be fixed is vexatious and litigious parents who are too quick to go to law to try and resolve things, that's absolutely not what we see through our experience of investigating complaints. The people who come to us have spent months or years navigating the system. They come to us as a last resort and they're absolutely exhausted. Um, there is no sense that the redress system is an easy option for parents at all. Um, also, the fact that we uphold 85% of the complaints that come to us, and similarly the tribunal upholds, I think something like nine out of 10 of the cases that come to them, suggests that people aren't abusing the redress system. The redress system is simply reflecting significant real problems that exist upstream. So if we need to fix this, it isn't about fixing redress, it's about getting things right first time. Okay, thank you. Imogen. Yes, I think I can be quite concise because I totally agree with um, my, my, my three uh, colleagues on the panel. Um, I think one of the things that we have seen uh, as a result of the pandemic is an increase in delays, which of course is very frustrating um, for, for, for families um, and uh, an even less engagement with local authorities. Local authorities have um, just from sort of personally dealing uh, with clients, uh, it, it is it is far harder to, to get hold of anybody in a local authority to address an issue at an early stage in a case than it ever was pre the pandemic. Um, and, and, you know, and parents are having to, to fight that themselves, you know, on a daily basis. And, and uh, you know, I agree with Michael, they don't turn to uh, the tribunal or to other forms of redress um, as anything other than a last resort. That's what, that's what we see. They don't want to have to be there. But equally, some of the other, um, you know, engagement that they have with local authorities at, at, at the early stage, including mediation, is just not um, satisfactory because it's not engaged in um, appropriately or effectively. Um, just finally, before I pass over to my colleague, um, uh, Tom Hunt, um, the Send Review says, and I quote, local authorities are uniquely placed to be a champion for the best interest of every child and young person in their area. As you know, um, our uh, predecessor education committee, which I was chair, in, when we did our report in 2019, uh, found that there was a tension in the role that uh, local authorities are being asked to play both as assessor and commissioner. <laughs> Professionals make decisions um, usually determined by budgetary constraints, which led to distrust uh, building up between parents and local authorities and moving uh, uh, further, us further away from the concept of local authorities as allies and champions and we suggested at the time that there should be some neutrality uh, injected into the system and recommended that a neutral advocate role be created to help parents and pupils navigate the SEND system. Do you uh, um, agree that the 
Um, it's, it, it's sad that the neutral advocate role was not put in the SEND review. Would it help to reduce some of the bureaucracy and adversarial tensions in the current system? And could this role support families with fewer resources more effectively than the proposed national standards and, media and mandatory mediation that's been proposed? Um, I'll start with you, um, Michael, please. Um, I, I think the, the problem you describe of the local authority being an assessor of need and then a commissioner of services um, isn't unique to um, children's services for, for children with special educational needs. It's something local authorities have to do across a number of services. And we see the same issue in adult social care. Um, I, I, I think my personal view would be that, that there isn't an inherent problem in local authority performing both of those roles. I think where we see distortions of, of what the standards we would expect are simply because local authorities do not have the resources to, to deliver properly. So, should, so should there be in a adult care... Should, sorry to interject, but should there be... What I'm trying to find out in a nutshell is do you think there should be a neutral advocate for families to help them navigate through the kind of treacle of unkind bureaucracy that they have to face when, when trying to get the right uh, uh, care for their child? I think, for me, my personal view on the complaints that I see is there's a fundamental problem with resources in the system, and I'm not sure an advocate would necessarily address that underlying okay. problem. Thank you. Um, Imogen? Yeah, I, I would say that there could be some real benefit in a neutral advocate, because um, if you look at the, the system of kind of, you know, parent partnership, parent forums that has been there previously, in local authorities where we see the parent partnership being more independent from the local authority than in some other areas, um, you, you find that they are really effective champions of support for parents and help them at a much earlier stage. In local authorities where your parent partnership is very much tied to the kind of local authority um, regime, for want of a better word, um, the outcomes are, are, are less effective. So, um, so yes, I have seen that kind of neutral advocacy, advocacy role at an early stage be, be really beneficial to parents. And um, Maroon, I'll please. Yeah, I, 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 I completely support what Imogen said is that 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 a um, that role already sort of already exists. We've got the Sendias services. The, the, the issue is to build on what Michael was saying is that the Sendias services have been woefully um, funded um, across the country, um, and where we see strong Sendias services, you actually see better relationships between parents and, and, and local authorities. A really important point though is Sendias services should also should also be extended to cover. Um, health and social care requirements and should and in the best areas we see sending our services being funded by health services and CCGs and ICSs as well very rarely though but the best okay. ones are thank you Ali and if you I, support it how, how do you see it working in, in practice uh, Ali I have sort of quite mixed feelings about this because I, I agree I think actually we've got the um, the Sendias um, service, I think that actually strengthening that by properly funding it, ensuring that they're able to offer a consistent service across the country um, and that they are truly impartial, they feel able to be truly impartial, would actually satisfy um, that requirement for a kind of neutral advocate. And I think, you know, we have seen the emergence of, of people setting up as advocates for um, parents and carers, which um, and charging significant amounts of money to people and often not um, not really helping along the way you know that can often be um, rather than being a benefit it, it can be a kind of barrier to, um, to to achieving what a child or young person needs so I would just be that's where my mixed feelings about this come from but I think strengthening the Sendia services as my colleagues have suggested is absolutely um, you know where you could where, where kind of change could be affected thank you Tom Thank you, um, Chair. It's j just in terms of um, when we have failure in the system and, and holding those appropriate organisations and individuals to account, I'm just wondering what that would look like in practice. So, for example, if you had a local authority, a local education authority that had you know, repeatedly let down um, young people with SEND, would it m potentially mean the government intervening, taking those powers off the LEA? I'm just wondering what it would look like in practice. Mm. That's to all, all panellists. Michael, do you want to go first? 
Yes, certainly. People can um, make a complaint to us. Once they've uh, exhausted the local authorities' complaints process, they can come to us. Uh, we're entirely independent, both of central government and of local government, and we we've got the powers of the High Court to carry out an investigation into those individual cases. Um, and, and indeed, we, we do that um, a great deal. The number of complaints that come to us has gone up every year since the new um, system was introduced. And we uphold between eight and nine out of 10 of every complaint we look at. Um, the difficulty with that though, and I don't for a moment suggest what we do as a panacea for all ills, is that um, we can only look at the system prior to, um, the, the, during the development of the plan, and then in the delivery phase, the middle part where you can go to the tribunal is a separate system. So I think it's confusing and difficult for parents to navigate that. I think also, I mean, we um, don't have any kind of budget to do any kind of outreach or awareness work. So there's many parents who would, um, could and should bring complaints to us for their concerns who simply don't know about our existence. Um, and as we've spoken about at this committee previously, there are some gaps in our jurisdiction, which mean that sometimes we're doing this job with our hands tied behind our back. We, we could do a great deal more to simplify the system for parents and to strengthen it um, if with some relatively straightforward changes to our jurisdiction. So the short answer is people can come to us and, and where we can, we provide an effective level of accountability, but far, few, far too, many, too, too few people know about our service and our jurisdiction is too limited. Um, this is to all. Um, I, I guess, though, it, I have a sort of specific question, which is to do with when you have a local education authority that is repeatedly um, been seen to be failing um, young people with special educational needs, of course, and indeed their parents. Um, uh, you know, w would there come a point, which do you think that point should perhaps come sooner than it is at the moment, where that local, local education authority could even be stripped of its authority? Um, yeah. Ali, why, why don't you start? Sure, I mean, I think, um, you know, when you look at what's happened in Birmingham, for example, with, with the kind of parachuting in of a, of a commissioner to sort of take over those services, um, it's been a long time coming, actually. So, you know, you've gone through this process of having had a local area send inspection, performing very badly, then having a revisit where, you know, progress against those areas of weakness was, was dire. Uh, and, and then it's taken time for something to happen. Um, I, I mean, certainly from our view, what we would, would like to see in terms of an accountability framework is whatever will force change within local authorities. Um, and I think it's also, you know, what what what, um, what Mick was saying. Actually, seeing an extension of the remit of the of the local government social care ombudsman to cover, you know, schools as well. It, it's it's that, you know, there's a there's a broader issue around kind of accountability. And actually, there's a there's a kind of there's been an agenda to reduce opportunities for individuals to hold public bodies to account. When you think about the changes to the availability of judicial review as a remedy, when you look at the plans around the Human Rights Act, um, and, and you know those things are really important in the context of um, individuals who are much more reliant on public body decision making as children, young people with SEND are. So, I think you know I would like to see the accountability framework to be whatever will change local authority behaviour punitive as it needs to be. I'd like to see an extension of the remit of, of the Ombudsman. I'd like to see better funding of legal aid in this area. And I'd like to see judicial review remaining an available and effective remedy for families. Um, do you think, um, as it stands, there are currently, uh, I've, I've got a sense of what the answer is going to be to this. Um, do you think there currently are enough incentives uh, for schools and education providers more generally, both um, financial both financial incentives, but also incentives in terms of assessment, Ofsted, etc., to provide first-class send provision. And Maruno. Short answer to that is no, and I think that's one of the the, the, the biggest issues we've got with the current SEND system. And I, I think it's very important. I think this 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 committee has got a very important role when it comes to the new schools white paper as well, and assessing how that's going to change things. Because let's be really clear about this. What is it that really incentivizes school leaders? Are they worried about um, attainment? Are they worried about attendance? Are they worried about behavior? Because that's the mood music. 
that comes from um, the regulators, that comes from the inspectors, that comes from the Department for Education. And that sets the, the, their priorities. SCND really doesn't feature that heavily. And if we look at those sort of areas of, of, of attainment, attendance and behavior, very often it's SEND children that are challenged in those areas for very good reasons, for reasons that we understand, often because they're not getting the right support. And so there's a really clear incentive there for school leaders not to be inclusive. And I, and I think that, that, that we can do whatever we want to in the SEND system and the SEND reforms. But the broader school's environment, the broader environment that the that, that SEND children live in is very much the, the tide is pushing the other way against inclusion, against the incentives to school leaders and, 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 and other, other systems leaders as well to be really inclusive and intervene early. Um, Pacey, I mean, I, many, many school leaders, um, you know, I talk to um, feel the same way. You know, I generally think there should never be a conflict. Um, education professionals and school leaders should never feel like there's a conflict between doing what they believe is morally the right thing to do and the right thing to do for young people we are responsible for, but also not unreasonably wanting to be professionally successful. So I guess taking that conflict away is important. Um, Ali. Yeah, I just want to say, I mean, I absolutely, you know, th there is a need to incentivize um, inclusion in mainstream, but it's also about making sure that there's an accountability framework in place as well. You can't have one without the other and obligations already exist under the Equality Act in terms of that duty to make reasonable adjustments. There's a presumption of mainstream education in the Children and Families Act where that's what is um, desired and, and it wouldn't be incompatible with the efficient education of others and there's nothing that could remove that incompatibility um, but you know despite those legal obligations actually mainstream schools frequently aren't inclusive and and many are not ready to take more children and young people with send without a fundamental shift in culture and, and you know just saying that schools need to be more inclusive or should be more inclusive will not make that happen and it, it just these proposals within the green paper about the majority of children and people will be in their local mainstream school in their local community they, what they fail to address is anything about what it means for schools to be genuinely inclusive and actually forcing inclusion can actually lead to children being excluded from mainstream education literally or indeed you know socially within that school environment um i i i, I have i've had i have met with uh, the um, chief inspector of Ofsted about the, some of the changes that could be made to try and provide better incentives. Um, some do feel that the new Ofsted framework is a step forward and may lead to some improvements when it comes to this. How do you feel about that? Um, Imogen. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, uh, just following on from what Ali said, um, which I completely agree with. Um, in terms of you know, accountability of schools for some of the behaviour around um, you know, lack of inclusion and, and kind of disability discrimination, um, there, are, there are some real concerns um, that I know that parents feel um, because the challenge through the tribunal for um, you know, discrimination in schools can be, a, I mean, it's, it is a, 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 an even more litigious um, procedure than, than, than a send appeal through the tribunal. And quite often it leads to a, a real relationship breakdown between schools and families so that the remedies that the tribunal can, can, can award are, are, are ineffective um, because, you know, if the tribunal can talk about additional provision or additional support or changes in um, training or whatever it might be, um, quite often the relationship's broken down so much that the, the families have had to move away from those schools. So there are no teeth, there's no incentive to schools to... Um, you know, to, to, to provide the right support because families, uh, you know, have had to vote with their feet on that. So I, I, I think changes to some of the remedies that the tribunal can, uh, you know, can order to really become, you know, to, to make schools accountable for this kind of behaviour would, would, would assist. I've just, I've just got two more questions. Um, firstly, the SEND Green Paper does talk about a new um, SENCO uh, qualification. I think it does talk about some more specialists and funding some more education psychologists. Um, but do you think there's also a point here about trying to ensure that every teacher, not just the specialist, but every teacher has a kind of like base level understanding of all different types of learning disability? 
and because it strikes me that in the mainstream setting that could be very important do you think there needs to be more work for example in teacher training to make sure that we don't just get more specialists but that every sort of regular teacher has a has a slightly higher level of understanding um, of all types of disability I definitely think that 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 that, that would assist. And um, the other, um, you know, body of, of of people to consider is are the sort of learning support assistance, teaching assistant cohort, because um, because in the main, um, in all settings, they are largely responsible for a great deal of provision that's delivered um, to children, including some quite kind of complex therapeutic provision, and uh, and 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 the skill set that's needed for that. Um, it needs some consideration because because that is a really important cohort of people that work with the Sen Senkos um, to deliver support. Um, fi final question from me is just about um, uh, sort of diagnosis of different uh, learning disabilities, some, particularly some that may be more hidden. Um, there is talk at the moment about the possibility of um, sort of universal screening requirement for dyslexia. That's currently something which is being discussed in Parliament by a number of colleagues. Um, I've had many discussions with um, uh, education professionals locally about how this could work and how we want to avoid any unintended consequences. Do you, would you agree a kind of universal screening of all uh, young people for not just dyslexia, but of course dyspraxia and, other, uh, and, and autism, etc.? Would you, would you be supportive of those sort of moves? That's to all, as to everyone, anyone who wants to answer it. Um, why don't we start with you, Michael? That's probably one for my colleagues, to be honest. I think it's not, um, it's okay. not something that okay. we Just put your hand up. Who would like on. to answer this? If you could just let me know on the screen. Uh, Maruno. Uh, yeah, yeah, so a simple answer is yes. I think that, that one, of the, one of the biggest, going back to something that Michael said earlier, is that the, 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 there's too much focus on the issue, issue at, the, at the back end when things are really broken down and things that have been tribunal or the ombudsman. One of the key things is, can we identify need early and the this is the this is the bit that that that, that we really need to and then respond early because because that's the bit that's really for uh, failing families at the minute is they it, it takes too long to identify a need um too much is diagnosis driven rather than needs driven mm -hmm. um and then even when you have got a diagnosis the services aren't there to meet those needs and hence, we end up with a very adversarial, conflict-ridden system. So early identification, early response is the way out of it. And by the way, it's cheaper as well. Okay, I just want to bring in, I'm going to bring in Kim Apsan and then Ian and Anna. So uh, Kim had a question. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, panel. I was just wondering, panel, how um, do you expect to deliver a first-class service when there has been significant underfunding to the sector for over 12 years? And the National Association of Head Teachers in a survey found that 90% of their schools said that the funding was insufficient and that the recruitment and retention of teachers to work in the sector has been a major problem. And do you think these issues have been identified in this green paper? Maybe Ali? Um, I mean, I think that the starting point has to be to recognise that the proposals in the Green Paper are absolutely not about improving families' experience or improving children and young people's outcomes. And actually, to, to pretend that they are is disingenuous. This, this is about saving money, but masking that um, and, and masking what's really being proposed in, a, in an effort to avoid the really undesirable position, I think, um, of the government saying it, it doesn't want to spend the necessary amount to meet the needs of children and people with SEND. So I think, you know, in answer to that question, I don't think it's going to be possible to deliver a first class service, but nor do I think that is the motivation behind the Green Paper proposals. And I think that's it's really important to acknowledge that. Thanks, Ali. Um, Absana. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just had a question, panel, firstly, about um, the previous committee's SEND report, which highlighted that supported internships are only available to young people with EHC plans, and that, that excludes the vast majority of young people with SEND who do not have EHC plans. What more do you think can be done by employers, education providers, and the government to support young people with SEND to develop their skills and transition into work? 
Um, perhaps if I come to Imogen first. Uh, we're going to go for Marunal first because okay. um, he has got a time constraint, as I understand it. Marunal. Uh, th thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, I completely agree. I, I think that um, um, uh, support in the, 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 the Green Paper, one of the big criticisms we've got of the Green Paper is that it it's, doesn't say enough about um, broader outcomes for children when they leave, leave education, young people when they leave education. So it doesn't say a lot about um, routes into work. It doesn't say a lot about community inclusion. It doesn't say a lot about independent living. And those are, those are, that's, that's, that, you know, we, we're preparing children to be successful young people and adults, and, and there's not enough around the outcomes there. To your point specifically around supported internships and routes into work, one of the things that we've always advocated for is actually, you know, we have things like education, health and care plans. Why don't we just change the E to an employment plan? The idea being that this kind of support that a young person is going to need to access education successfully is not going to be too dissimilar to the kind of support that a young person is going to need to access employment, for example, successfully. And there's a really strong case for, for some sort of um, work-based passport of the kinds of reasonable adjustments and the kind of support a young person will need to access work and have a successful work career that, that I think is a, is, a, is, a, is a missed opportunity here. And do you think it's, you know, you talk about the employment plan, but do you think what's missing here is, is really that stronger guidance that is needed around employment as well, um, you know, specifically for SEND um, people? Again, uh, so and, and I'll defer to. There's a lot, you've got a number of lawyers on this, this panel. So I think I think that the, again the 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 law around reasonable adjustments um, exists already, and and I think that 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 many employers are um, either don't understand the law or are or are immediately scared um, to, to to bring on somebody with an additional need um, because they fear that it would incur additional costs. And I think that there are schemes like um, uh, from the, um, the, the disability awareness schemes uh, uh, um, that the DWP runs. But I think that there's, there's more we could do in order just to make it very, very clear that these are the sorts of reasonable adjustments this particular young person may need and support this particular young person may need to successfully enter employment. And this is the support that the government can offer employers in actually helping them make that transition that actually is not insurmountable and again charities like men capital and some fantastic research around um uh employment for people with additional needs and have found some really really strong economic cases particularly around loyalty and length of tenure and uh, 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 um and diligence um that suggests that that makes a good economic sense to employ people with SEND. And of course, we all know there's a labour shortage at the moment. So why wouldn't we want to push this as a strong agenda for, from, from government? Thank you. I'll come to Imogen next. Yeah, I think in terms of um, post-19 provision generally, um, there is a real kind of lack of um, engagement with, with with some of the systems, um, particularly in terms of e even the levels of provision that are available at a local level in, in say, mainstream colleges. And then I think that impacts on the, the kind of individualized support being identified for each individual moving, moving forward. So I think it's a real sector where um, I, I was expecting in the paper to see a lot more focus um, because it is it is one of the um, you know it, it's one of the areas where I think um, I, I think that the, the kind of further education sector um, in terms of provision it falls far behind the, the school sector um, in many ways and I think that does leave uh, young people quite disadvantaged so you know I would be supporting you know a lot more sort of training support provision and and individualized need rather than um uh, you know as you said at the start of your question a focus on the need for an ehcp to access um certain you know types of provision and internships uh, if, if it was if it was identified more on an individualized basis that would that would be a, a, a much greater assistance thank you do any of the other panelists want to comment i think tom has got a quick point on this point on FE. Yeah, I'm back. Um, it's quite soon after I finish what I start. But, um, um, I've, 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 um, so, but yeah, it is about this. I mean, I really, um, you know, share the importance of, you know, FE um, supporting young people with uh, 
um, inclusion needs um, between 16 and 18, getting them ready for the world of work is a crucial, crucial period. Um, and I think Imogen just touched upon some of the shortcomings of the status quo and, and how it wasn't really mentioned perhaps as much as we would have liked in the Green Paper. Um, it is my understanding, I was wondering if it's also your understanding, that there isn't actually an explicit requirement for FE colleges to have an inclusion team. That is my current understanding. Uh, secondly, um, do you, you know, how much of an issue do you think is the lack of funding at FE colleges to support individuals of inclusion needs? If one of you'd like to answer that, anyone? Any, um, Ali? <laughs> I mean, I don't think it's just about money. I think it's also about culture and I think it's about understanding legal obligations and having having the motivation to to change and to be inclusive. And I think that is something that spreads across both, um, you know, the, the kind of compulsory education system and also further education. Um, so, you know, when you were talking earlier about, about um, making sure that um, school staff have the skills and knowledge um, to meet the needs of, of a variety of special educational needs, actually they also need to understand the legal framework because that's often where things break down and that relationship particularly between parents and schools because what, what schools will often repeat is actually this, this kind of uh, misunderstanding of what the law is because they rely on what they're told by local authorities. So, and I mean, we have recently started training SENCOs and uh, there's been quite a few light bulb moments um, in, you know, in, in, with attendees on those courses. So I think it is, there, need, there needs to be, it's more than just pushing money in. And, and I've always said that, that you won't resolve the, the issues in, um, in the SEND system by just pumping more money in. I think there is a need for more money potentially, but actually it's also about um, a shift in culture and attitudes. Um, thank you, I'm gonna bring in, uh, have you, sorry, you've got a oh, One more question, yeah. if that's okay, Joe. I just want to ask about the workforce again. Um, are you worried in specifically in terms of the Send Green um, Review Green Paper that there is a, a lack of focus on investing in empowering um, uh, teachers of like especially support teachers um, and um, yeah I just want to understand a bit more about that I mean I, I work very closely with the National Deaf um, uh, Children's uh, Society when my um, nurseries which primarily catered for um, uh, children of, with um, uh, who are deaf. Um, from from closure and, and and they've said to me that they're very concerned about you know the lack of focus in this paper on um specialist um workforces and and how to empower and invest in that workforce so i just want to get a sense of your thoughts on that would you like to comment on that imogen yeah i mean one of the things for me i mean uh, the green paper obviously talks about kind of standardization and um and and you know looking at standardization of, of almost needs and, and provision and it, that really concerns me that we are moving away from that kind of high level individualized um focus on individualized need and individualized support and i think that feeds then into the the question of delivery of those really highly specialist services for children with particular needs um because because the minute you sort of block things um you put children in a kind of pigeonhole rather than uh, you know an individualized bracket and that you know that that's really concerning and, and that also feeds through in the green paper to the funding the idea that um funding bans for example um could be utilized on a you know on a more kind of standardized basis we see them in use now and effectively what that means is that um you know that the, the, the provision is pushed down to the lowest common denominator and that that parents are having to fight to to get out of funding bans because uh, and that the funding bans aren't applied individually to their child and their child's individualized needs um so it's a real concern that, that the idea of standardization um will significantly impact those kind of highly highly specialist and complex uh, you know interplay of, of needs that we see in a, a number of children thank you thank you ian, ian. yeah uh, i've been really interested in 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 the, the, the way in which um, answers have, have been coming this morning, but I just can't help thinking that from the answers which have been given to several different questions, that um, funding and rationing are a big problem within the system. And, and I know that um, Ali just said it wasn't just about pumping money, but the, the, the problem that we've got is that, that, that the most local authorities are behaving in the way in which they do 
because they're trying to ration out the funding which they have available and whether that means that en parents end up at tribunals or at the ombudsman it's all part of that that rationing mentality and and, and the, the kind of I think that got into a situation where they can't see the wood for the trees anymore. You know, it's just the, it's just the, the attitude that, that, that they've come up with. But I mean, when you say that 95% of tribunal cases are, have been successfully um, uh, come down for the appellant, uh, that's got to be just false economy from the perspective of, of local authorities. But, but I mean, we all do know, I mean, in, in, in previous reviews that we've done, um, we, we've heard estimates from people around the, the, the sector and talking about how much money would we need in the, in the special needs block and an additional five to seven billion pounds were, were mentioned on, on by people in, in different contexts. And, and if we could get that right, but also then get the systems right, we might be getting somewhere towards where we need, need to be to meet the needs of children um, within the system. We've now got this green paper, and so given that the proposed send reforms, which I think have been described this morning as wolves in sheep's clothing, I think by Ali, um, but so that's going to take time to implement, though, whether we agree with them or not. And, and the SAND review has identified serious issues with the current system. So what more should the government be doing now to support children and young people with SEND? you know, until these reforms can be brought in. Is there anything specific, any, any sort of magic bullet you can think of that which would help in the current situation? Michael, you look poised there. Yeah, um, so certainly I agree with your analysis of the situation here. There's a fundamental problem with the resourcing of this system. And when we investigate problems in local authorities, it's not that the people who are trying to deliver those services are acting with ill will. Um, by and large, they are dedicated, hardworking people who are trying to make a system work, which simply often doesn't have the resources in it to, to, to deliver. So, I mean, I completely agree with your analysis. Um, I think in terms of areas where we, we could improve now, what we sometimes see is that where we have found a problem, we try not to just focus on solving it for the individual. What we try and do is identify the root cause analysis of why a local authority is making um, upstream administrative mistakes, how it can learn and how it can improve, and we feed that back. And what we see in, in the best local authorities is they'll take that learning on board and they'll use complaints and they'll use their mistakes as a way to learn and improve for the future. Um, and we also have seen in some local authorities where we've identified systemic failures that actually the local authorities then been able to reinvest in children's services where that's needed additional funding. So I do think that um, a very simple way of improving the process at the moment is increasing accountability, increasing transparency, because that drives learning and it drives improvement. And, uh, and as other witnesses have said, sometimes that can actually mean saving money by doing things right first time. So I think making sure people are aware of their rights to challenge the system where it's failing. And also, in, in terms of my own service, making sure we've got the power to actually look at those areas which are, are currently outside scope would be an easy one. I mean, just to, without taking up too much time, just an example of that. The previous question was about those children who don't have uh, an education, health and care plan, but who rely on more general SEN support in schools. Now, actually, if we got that right, probably fewer people would want to plan because they would be confident that they were getting the support they needed early on. Now, at the moment, if you have a plan, you can come to us or you can come to the tribunal to, to complain about what's, what's happening. If you're receiving SEN support informally in a school, you've got no right of redress to an independent body at all. So a very simple way of giving per increasing parental trust in that early part of the system where we might be able to get things right more quickly would be to give a body like ours the opportunity to be able to hear parental concerns about the way in SEN support was being given at those early stages and what we perceive to be a, a level of rationing and underfunding of that. So there's very simple mechanisms where we can increase transparency, openness and learning in the system without that introducing huge additional cost. Thanks. Um, Ali, please. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I would absolutely agree with that point. And I think, you know, this this whole, the, it, it feels as though the, the government's diagnosis of the problem with SEND provision in this country is that there's just too much of everything. <laughs> there's too many education, health and care plans. There's too many children in special schools, particularly independent special schools. There's too many tribunal appeals and there's too much money being spent. And, and the, this, these proposals are really motivated by a desire to reduce all of these things uh, and improve statistics. And actually, you know, focusing on what you can do in order to um, improve decision making and, and hold, hold local authorities to account is where, really where the attention needs to be. And the reality is that this issue of accountability is not going to go away. I mean, even if the law is changed, many of the proposals won't work without robust accountability mechanisms. So, you know, as Mick says, you can only strengthen SEN support if there's an accountability mechanism to enforce it. Um, you can only make mainstream schools more inclusive if there's an accountability mechanism to challenge them for not being inclusive. Um, and, you know, I think that's that's where the problem lies, actually. And, and nothing in here is, I mean, I think the, the chapter in the Green Paper on, on accountability is shameful. Mm, thanks. Bruno, please. Yeah, and I think you're exactly right in that the, 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 there, there clearly isn't enough money in the SEND system. It's also true to say that the money that is in the SEND system isn't being spent effectively at the moment because too much of it is being spent when families get to crisis. Mm -hmm. So we hear time and time again from parents that's, that describe going along to the school gate, talking to the CENCO and say, saying, I've got a concern. Six months later, they're back. Nothing's happened. And they're saying, I've now got a problem. Six months later, they're back. And they're saying, we are now a family in crisis. And that's when things happen. And we all know that dealing with crises are much more expensive than dealing with concerns. So if we can shift the where the, where the money is spent, so going back to your original question, how can we, how, how can we come out of this, this vicious spiral? Uh, 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 you know, the, the simple answer is listen to families. Parents, we all, we all as parents know our children better than anybody else. And when they're a little bit off color, we know earlier than anybody else. Listen to families' concerns. Spend the money then because you are going to spend the money because SEN doesn't go away by ignoring it. All that happens is that needs exacerbate, frustration grows, anger grows. And that's where families end up needing, feeling they need EHCPs. They, they need to go to tribunal to secure the legal right to, to, to the services that they should just be able to get. Mm -hmm. And this is actually an area where I think that the, um, you know, <sighs> clarity around what, you know, what families can expect will be really important. Mm -hmm. And that's where the national standards, I think, are uh, proposed in the paper are very helpful. Thank you. Imogen, if we get this right, you'll be looking for another job. Is that right? Well, yeah, and I was, uh, you know, I've always said that that would be the holy grail. I would, uh, <laughs> I would agree. I mean, one of the things that just well, leading on from that, I'll say something re reasonably controversial in terms of accountability of local authorities. Um, I mean, obviously, the tribunal at the present time is a no-cost jurisdiction, um, and whilst I'm not necessarily suggesting that. Um, that, that costs are introduced in all cases. Actually, that there is no deterrent to the local authority to run um, to run tribunal cases uh, as a matter of you know standard. They quite often nowadays barely engage in the process. They do the bare minimum to comply with tribunal deadlines, and then there's a big flurry, um, you know, two or three days before a hearing where they're trying to kind of settle things and sort things out. But they've dragged parents six months down the line and six months further away from provision, and there is no. Um, detriment to them in terms of doing that they might lose the tribunal case but 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 where's the kind of stick to beat them yeah. in, in that sense and and actually they would perhaps only have to be hit once or twice before it, it hit home they need to be dealing with these things six 12 months earlier before you get into that spiral of um spiral of tribunal system do, do any of you share my concern though that you know that we've got many parents who do negotiate the system and manage to get to a tribunal or manage to get to see the ombudsman but do, you, do any of you share my concern that there'll be many parents who just can't, who can't negotiate all of that and will give up and their children don't end up getting the, the services that they really need? Which is why I think the neutral advocate idea is, is an important one. 
I think that's right. I mean, I, I always say that the, the kind of the, the local authorities wait to see the whites of a parent's eye at every stage in the process. So at each stage, they'll refuse to assess, and then there'll be a number of parents who just drop off and give up. Then at, at the next stage, there'll be another set of parents who drop off. And by the time they're on their third tribunal, um, you're really down to the real kind of, you know, Die hard people that I can either can afford it or or really have the gumption to go for it. Yeah. Um, and at every stage there'll be a drop off, and local authorities rely on that. Yeah. Uh, um, the, the, the proposed reforms in, in the review um, uh, includes things such as a national statutory send standard and standardised digital EHC plan templates. Uh, templates, and, uh, and that's, this is to address consistency or the postcode lottery. Uh, do, do, do you see any of that working, or, 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 or is it just a sort of smokescreen from, from your perspective? Ali, you've got your hand up. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, I think I'm not sure that people recognise that these proposed national standards just cannot be absorbed within the existing send law framework. Right. And actually, what they're going to do is they're going to change thresholds and they're going to change processes for support. Mm. And, and I think few people realise that. So when you look at what the Green Paper says about national standards, it says they're going to be setting out how needs should be identified and assessed, including how and when an assessment should take place, who should be involved in the assessment process, how the information and evidence collected should be recorded and monitored, how, how processes will be you know, reviewed and how support will be reviewed. And, and all of these things are set out very clearly already in the Children and Families Act and in the SEND regulation. So what this actually means is a change to those, those legal provisions. So a change to the test for an EHC needs assessment. And we, we suspect that that will mean um, you know, the re reduction of rights and entitlements and a raising of thresholds so that fewer children and young people will qualify for an EHC needs assessment. Um, similarly, you know, we've got a test for an EHC plan. We've got a um, very clear legal framework for the form an EHC plan has to take. We have a very clear legal framework for the annual review process to look at um, whether provision and support remains appropriate. The idea that these will be um, addressed through national standards means all of that is going to be diluted. And I think it's really, really important that, that families understand the implications of what's being proposed here because it's, it's, it's very clearly about reducing rights and entitlements and raising, raising thresholds. Okay, I, I mean, I, I, I saw people nodding there, so I take it people would broadly agree with that. Uh, one other thing about this, this review, do you think there's anything within it which sort of tells you that the government are, are, are intending to do any significant workforce planning so that we've got the right professionals in the right places um, so that people's um, concerns can be addressed very quickly? In a nutshell, if you can, any of you? Anyone? I'm not sure I see that. Okay. To be honest, in the document, okay. I you, see, you, see. You, you don't think it's addressed within the within the review? No. Okay. okay. Um, Ali, briefly, please. Yeah, I mean, I would just say that you know the, the proposals around strengthening the SEN support and putting that on a statutory footing. If if you if we're going to improve SEN support, which is one of the areas that, that we're very supportive of at Ipsy. Um, we absolutely think that's necessary. That's only going to be possible if what you have got is sufficient input from educational psychologists, from specialist teachers. You know, when you think about the, the nature of the children and people whose needs are generally met without an EHC plan and at the SEN support level, you're only going to make that better and improve SEN support if there is the capacity and the resource within educational psychology services, within specialist services to provide input. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Anna. Thank you. We're, we're going to come on to finance a bit later, I think. So, but um, I do want to focus on the the numbers here, um, and in particular, I'm interested in the increase in SEN pre-pandemic. I think we can all understand very, very well why the pandemic um, will have been a disaster for SEN support. And indeed, I went round a very good junior school and infant school in West Lee in my patch yesterday, and they have a very good SEN provision in school, which they couldn't possibly have done during lockdown. So, but, so I'm much more interested in the fact that, that we've got a, had an increase in SEN numbers um, 
from 2017 to 2019, and of course that we've had an increase in children on e EHC plans as well. And what I'd like to know is what do you see as the main factors behind this increase in special educational needs? And so I'm not interested in hearing about lack of money. I'm interested in what are the fundamental factors at play here. And I'd like to know what would be the one thing that each of you would like to see happen to increase SEN su uh, and support? Putting aside the issue of funding, please, if we can, at this point. Um, Ali. Um, I think in terms of the increase in the number of EHC plans, you know, when, when these reforms brought in in 2014, they extended the age range for, for the level of protection um, up to 25 and started it from birth. Inevitably, that was going to mean a greater number of children and young people with special educational needs protected by the legal framework and therefore qualifying for education, health and care plans and requiring those, that support. I think also, you know, we constantly see medical advances. We see children now surviving conditions that they perhaps wouldn't. They're, they're living longer, actually. They, those are issues that are, are, are fundamentally going to impact on, on the, the number of children and people who require EHC plans. In terms of one thing that I would like to see, it's absolutely no dilution of legal rights and entitlements. Don't change the law. Tackle the accountability and the failure to comply with the law as it stands. Thank you. Michael, or, or whoever get, wants to go next, I can see Michael in, in, in my screen. <laughs> um, I've, got, I've got nothing to add to what Ali said about the underlying um, trends and numbers, but in terms of the, the one thing, I think I'd go back to what I said earlier on, that um, if we want to make the system work in terms of people who get an SEN support um, in for, more informally in schools, um, and also if we want to look at things like children being out of school, being off-rolled, being excluded, um, give us the power to look at parental concerns about what's going on inside schools. That would be my one improvement. Thank you. Who wants to go next? Maybe, that go. We, yeah. maybe we don't ask every witness every, every answer, but carry on. Yeah. Interested in the one thing that they consider to be the most important thing. I think early, early intervention, intervention as early as possible in the system, not dragging parents through delays and also not delaying in getting to children. As Moonal said earlier, parents know their children best. So when their parents are calling out issues, you know, preschool, um, you know, in those kind of early year settings, dealing with it at that point before it becomes more entrenched. And um, obviously early intervention creates a, a better outcome for young people. Thank you. I think that, um, for me, I think that uh, the, the the key thing is remove the disincentives to be inclusive across the system, particularly in schools. And there's one, you know, I'm a big, you know, one silver bullet. And, and again, I've spoken to, we've spoken to Offset about this. Um, no school can be good or outstanding unless it is good or outstanding for SEND. Mm. Thank you. The, what the, the, my follow-up is, um, you, a, number, a number of you have, have mentioned that, that families um, and parents know their children best, which I would wholeheartedly agree with as a mother. But what about the children that are in the most disadvantaged settings of all, where perhaps for whatever reason the parents are just not able to fulfill that function of engaging with the school? Uh, do you think that, um, that the review does enough or indeed does anything to tackle SEN in the most disadvantaged of, of families? Ali, again, or Maroon, Maroon, why don't you go first this time? Um, yeah, um, no, it doesn't. Um, and and, and I, I, complete, I think we completely share your concerns because you know, there is a huge overlap between um, SEND, between looked after children, between um, uh, children who um, uh, receive free school meals, between those in the criminal justice system. And, and there's that, that, that the, the, if you draw a Venn diagram, there's a huge intersection there. And I don't think that, the, that we are doing collectively enough 
around those children. Um, and again, the, the, the point I'd make there is that this is not uh, solely an SEMD issue, but I think that the key thing here I'd, I'd, I'd make is that by getting the right support for those children, um, particularly in addressing their SEND, you're actually not making a special case for SEND. You're actually looking at looking after their needs when it comes to them being looked after. You're looking after their needs when it comes to them, um, their, their, their free school meals. You're looking after. You're, you're probably stopping them getting into the criminal justice system. So I think there's. We've long advocated this idea of key working for the most vulnerable families and the most vulnerable um, children. There is something in the NHS long-term plan around key working for those with the most complex needs, but it is those with the most complex medical um, needs. I think there's a strong case to be made for key working for those with the most complex SEND and social needs, which is where I think you're, you're, you're headed with your question. Thank you. Anybody else want to add to that? Ali. I, I would just say that, you know, what's proposed in the green paper is to dilute rights and entitlements across the board. These, these groups of children and people, which, which I touched on earlier, those who are looked after, those who are in criminal detention, they are disadvantaged in the current system. They will be more disadvantaged under the new system that's proposed. Um, and I think, you know, particularly when you're thinking about um, children in the context of social care, I mean, you know, very little has been said in the Independent Review of Children's Social Care that was published yesterday, more generally around disabled children. And, and I think, you know, disabled children always seem to be the poor relation in the context of children in need. And both of the reviews, both the Independent Review of Children's Social Care and the SEND review seem to have been relying on the other to address the issue of disabled children. And in fact, neither says much about them. And, and it feels as though, you know, children with disabilities are, are, are a ball in a game of ping pong between the SEND review and the Independent Review of Children's Social Care. Mm, that's very interesting. Anybody else want to add to this before? Uh, I'll perhaps ask my final question. Oh, sure. You want to ask your... Do you mean the question later on? Yes, can I yeah, ask sure, that? Sure. Yes. So, um, obviously, funding is an issue, and you've, you've all touched on the fact that the £70 million, um, announced for these reforms um, is not enough. But the overall budget for uh, uh, children with high needs is now 9.1 billion, an increase of 1 billion on previous years. That is a huge proportion of the, um, uh, of, of, um, the educational uh, budget for a start. So we have got to, as well as arguing the funding case, we have also got to look for efficiencies and I wonder whether you have any thoughts on where actually money could be saved to make sure that the money that is spent really does go to help the most disadvantaged children. Who wants to think about that? Um, Imogen. I mean, I, I would go back to, to, to Ali's point around the, the legislation that we've got under the Children and Families Act um, sets out quite clearly um, the roles of, of education, health and social care um, in the round. And it's around, to me, ensuring that all those services are properly engaged and that the system operates in the way that the legislation envisaged it should. Um, you know, making kind of efficiency such as suggested in the green paper, you know, ban funding bans, um, etc., is not going to be the answer. What we need to do is go back to the original legislation and, and, and operate that effectively and have the right accountability um, in play. And, and to make sure that those three organisations um, are, are, are effectively cooperating because there is so much um, you know, sort of interlinked between them. Um, I, I think kind of short-term efficiency, such as suggested, won't, won't ultimately solve the problem or, or that they're, they're, they're a sticking plaster over what um, really needs to be done. Thank you. Anybody else on that, on funding? Michael. Uh, I, th I think one of the common themes we see um, and the complaints that come to us are, are the ones which have become intractable, they've gone on for months, if not years. Sometimes at the heart of those issues is basic um, procedural failure right at the start of the process where the local authority perhaps hasn't kept 
in touch with the family, it hasn't communicated to them, hasn't listened to them, it hasn't gathered the right evidence, um, and we see particular problems with uh, local authorities being able to get the right evidence from the health service, um, and there, there aren't the right kind of partnerships. So sometimes huge amounts of time and money and effort are spent by local authorities in trying to fix problems which actually have got their origin in basic administrative errors upstream. And I think making sure that the system itself is administered in a really simple, effective and positive way upstream could save a huge amount of angst and difficulty for everybody um, downstream. Thank you. Has anybody not contributed? Marunul, have you contributed? Yeah, I, I think I'd go back to uh, go back to something I said earlier, which is that it, it's early intervention. It's you know it, it really is early intervention, um, and to build on what what both Michael and Ali have said, it's it's not just early inter intervention in education. It's a it's a it's a wrap around the child and, and the family from education, health, and care services. And again, I think this is where I think some some form of the national standards so that people, families are aware of what they can expect from services but also really critically uh, the services are aware of what they can expect from each other mm. is would be really important to, to to provide that sort of clarity around you know uh, what that early intervention looks like the last, my last very, very short follow-up is when I talk about SEN funding with my Director of Children's Services at South End City Council, one of the, one of the criticisms I hear, uh, or suggestions rather, is that funding should be ring-fenced when it's going to, um, for, for, uh, for SEN or for, um, or, or for the most disadvantaged um, children's programmes. Do you recognise that as, as an issue? And if so, do you, would you agree that with funding being ring-fenced? Michael? Um, I think it's um, the problem with arguing for ring fencing in one area of local authority services is that clearly adult care services would make the same case, as would highways, as would planning. Um, local authorities, I mean, fundamental part of local authorities is that elected members have the discretion to decide how they will spend their budget. So I think, um, you know, this is probably a matter for the local government association rather than for me to comment on. But I think there's a long-standing tenant of, of local government that um, local democracy depends on um, of members having the ability to choose how they spend their funding. So I, I think it would be going against a fairly long-standing principle of local government okay. to okay. try and ring-fence individual okay. services. And, and, okay. and of you. course, many others would make the same case. I think, because I, I, we're pressed for time, I'm, I want to move on to Miriam, who's not had a chance yet. Thank Maybe. you, Chair. Um, yeah, a lot of, some of the questions I was gonna, going to ask have already been answered, but I suppose listening to you, you paint a very bleak picture, not only of what the SEND environment is like now and how it's got worse as a result of the pandemic and other things, um, but also of the um, failure of the Green Paper to get to the bottom of um, those um, challenges. So two questions. One, are there any good bits of the Green Paper that you welcome? Uh, but secondly, how did the right of the Green Paper get it so wrong? What, you've mentioned the fundamental misunderstanding of the need for accountability and early help, but what do you think is behind that? Why, why is there this big discrepancy between what you think is wrong and what the, the Green Paper has, has outlined? Who would like to go first? Ali, you've been nodding along. Can I go to you? <laughs> Uh, the good bits, let's say something positive. Yes. So I think, you know, what, what we would probably say about the good bits is, you know, the proposal for a, um, a national template for an EHC plan, that's positive. Of course, we would have liked to have seen that many, many years ago, but um, we think that's positive. Um, putting SEN support on a statutory footing, we definitely see that as a positive. And actually, we were concerned that the extended powers of the tribunal to make non-binding recommendations about health and social care needs and provision might also um, fall by the wayside as a result of the SEND review. It's been confirmed those powers will continue. We would obviously like them to be able to make orders rather than non-binding recommendations, but it's positive that those powers are going to remain. Um, in terms of why they've got it so wrong. I think it's because the motivation is to 
Um, it's coming back to the point I made earlier, which is that this, this sense that the government sees the problems of being too much of everything, and part of what they want to do is save money, and it is not going to be possible to do that mm. without diluting rights and entitlements, but, but you know, avoiding that very undesirable position of coming out and saying, we do not want to put this much money into supporting children and people with SEND anymore. We can't, it's not sustainable, and therefore the only way that we can um, make it sustainable, in our view, is, is to reduce rights and entitlements. And I think that's, you know, that that's fundamentally the problem. And when you look at these issues, you know, things like banding, we are really concerned about that for the reasons that Imogen touched on earlier. But, you know, the, the, the current position is that work out what an individual child's needs are and push in place the support that meets those needs. What the reforms appear to be saying is work out what the standard provision is for this level of need and give the child that. And, and that kind of one size fits all approach means that support will be capped. The fact is special educational provision isn't standard. Mm. The clues in the name, yeah. it's special, it's unique, it's different, it's individualized. And, and you know, when you think about some of those rarer conditions, you know, what will the standard type of support and placement for a child or young person with say Rett syndrome be or Ehlers-Danlos? What does that look like? Uh, and, and I think, you know, that's that's really problematic. When you think about ASD, it's a spectrum. Varying in different types of need, the level of support will be different. The needs of children and people with Down syndrome will vary considerably. So I, I think it is, it, it's not workable and it is only going to mean that children and young people will lose out on the support that meets their individual needs. Thank you. Um, who'd like to go next? We don't all have to answer. No, sure. Let's um, go for the Maroon. Uh, maybe go to the Muir. Um, um, yeah, um, I, I think I think the feedback from family, families are actually quite. Um, uh, the, uh, the feedback we're getting is that they're very supportive of the national standards. The issue being that the absence of any national standard, there is no flaw. There, mm. <laughs> there, there, there is no bottom. Um, and um, uh, the feedback we're getting uh, from, from families at the minute is that, that um, greater clarity around what they're entitled to will help. So then, very supportive of the national standards. The idea being that if you know what you're entitled to, it, it removes a lot of the rub and a lot of disputes from the system. If you know what you're entitled to, it'll help drive early intervention. If you know what you're entitled to, it'll help services work together because they will all know what is, is expected of them and of each other. So there's quite a lot of support um, from families around um, the national standards. But I think Ali's points are very well made in that let's be clear that these should not be seen as a cap. They should, should not be seen as a, a, a maximum. I think mm. what we're set, setting here is a, is mm. a floor where none exists at the moment. And, 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 and sadly, um, you know, it's too many people have, 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 have ended up way below where, where anything like a reasonable, uh, reasonable provision. So I think there's, that, that's, that's very positive. And I also agree with the other points that Ali made, particularly around, particularly around the SEN support. So I think that that's where the system really has broken down in the sense that people have not been getting the support they need early enough, yeah. leading to an escalation across all sorts of fronts. Yeah. Okay, m moving on then. Um, so clearly, SEND covers a, a huge spectrum of different needs, as you've just described, Ali. And you know, I'm not an expert in this at all, but the way I see it is we've kind of got children with very specific health needs that are mainly health-driven um, and with a medical element. But you've also got a kind of, I don't know what you'd call... Um, lower level learning difficulties in school that still have a big impact on those children um, and it seems to me that you're saying that you know early intervention in those learning difficulties could make a huge difference rather than it getting to the point becomes a, a, a problem or a crisis but I suppose the problem from the government's point of view is resources are limited I mean that is absolutely the case and if we are going to start plowing money into early intervention particularly into early years which ought to pay dividends in the long term then there has to be either savings or at least cost limitations elsewhere. So the government can't do everything. So what should the priority be? Um, should the money be spent on making sure that all families can get to the end of the adversarial process? Or should it actually be re redirected into early support and early intervention, even in the, in the early years? Um, could I go to Imogen? 
please. Yeah, I, 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 I don't think parents want to go down no. another serial route. Um, I think that, that that is absolutely the last resort for them. There could be a significant cost saving um, in terms of make, you know, local authorities being accountable, following the legislation as it currently stands, uh, delivering, uh, you know, on their, uh, you know, on their on the requirements early enough to prevent that from happening. Um, but, but you know this, the, the the level of kind of training and support i think for for local authority officers sometimes who don't understand i i genuinely think a lot of local authority officers um they, they learn the law from other local authority officers not from not from the law and and that does you know that creates a real issue because it's the law according to a particular local authority um, and and if we if we can get to that um and get people trained properly mm. we we would we would ultimately avoid the kind of cost um of of, of those kind of you know tribunal yeah. cases and adversarial things that have to happen when things fall down okay thank you finish all your questions yes i think so. okay um kim Thanks, Chair. Um, good afternoon. Good morning, panel. We've heard some of the failings of um, this green paper, and particularly in terms of um, individual groups. And um, in the 1970s, disproportionately higher numbers of black children were identified as educational subnormal. And at the moment, what we're seeing is high levels of black pupils being um, diagnosed with SEND. So I just want to know whether you see any parallels. And what does this paper need to do to make sure <coughs> the needs of disadvantaged and vulnerable children are met? So maybe I'll start with Imogen, please. Um, I, I, I have to say I'm not close enough to the figures in terms of um, in terms of diagnosis of, 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 of black children, but what I would say is that um, that I think that the legislation is there. We go back to, to, to the point I think that Ali's made quite eloquently several times, um, and and actually the, the 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 legislation and the regulations provide for you know individualised support you know as a, as a child as any individual presents, and it's about us being able to um, identify ways to enable and ensure that all children are identified as early as possible. Um, and in the right way, um, it, it, you know, I, and I, I think it, it is it is is identifying those particular groups of vulnerable children who perhaps are slipping through the net at the moment for that early intervention uh, and additional focus on that and bringing them into the system sooner um, is essential. Thanks, Imogen. Ali, do you have any further anything further to add? I mean, I guess the only thing I would add is that I think what the Green Paper fails to do is address any of the issues around behaviour exclusion and attendance. And actually, they are intrinsically linked with SEND. Um, and, you know, we know that a disproportionate number of black children, young people are excluded. And, and what seems to happen is that the DfE continues to develop policy in these areas that will have a really big impact on children with SEND. But there's no join up within the department. So, you know, we, we've seen within the last few months consultations around school attendance, consultations around behavioural exclusion, then the SEND review comes out. It needs to join up if you're going to tackle some of these um, problems around groups who are particularly disadvantaged. Thanks, Sally. Anybody else want to add? Yeah, just just if I might come in and say that 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 it goes back to what I said earlier around the incentives for school leaders and around the mood music that comes down around attainment, around attendance, around behaviour, and uh, and SEND children are disproportionately impacted on, by that by that tone that's set. And I think similarly, I, I spoke a little bit earlier around intersectionality when it comes to looked after children and free school meals, and you can make exactly the same comment around. Um, um, ethnic minorities and uh, as, as a disadvantaged group as well in that. Thanks very much. Mike, did you want to come in? Um, only to agree with my colleagues, but I think suppose the point I would add, and it does go back to the question of um, people who are currently excluded from uh, their rights of redress because they find it difficult to navigate the system. And I think one of the challenges in my job is we only, we can only deal with the complaints that come to us inevitably the people who come to us are the ones who've either been given some help to find their way through to us or that they're the most persistent people who know how to navigate the system one of the real concerns therefore is that there's lots and lots of people 
um, who, for a variety of reasons of different disadvantage, can't get through to, to us. In most of Europe and most of the Commonwealth, um, an office like mine would have a power of what's called own initiative investigation. So where you feel that there are probably people whose voice isn't being heard and who are being excluded from the system and who are unlikely to actually make a complaint to you themselves, an office like mine would be able to go and conduct an investigation into the kind of concerns that you're raising. We'd be able to have our own initiative go in and look at the way in which local authorities were dealing with particular groups through the um, special educational needs system. Currently, the Ombudsman in Northern Ireland has that power. The Ombudsman in Wales has that power, but we don't. Um, so again, there's, there's, a, there's a mechanism here that a tried and tested one elsewhere in the world where you can actually not wait for complaints. You can actually go and anticipate problems and you can go and investigate what's going on behind the scenes. Um, and that's certainly a power we've called for before in relation to adult care. Um, and it might well be one that would be appropriate here. Mike. Thanks, panel. Some more questions. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Miriam wants to come back. Yes. Um, sorry, I missed one earlier. Um, so one of the proposals in the SEND review is to provide a predetermined uh, list of settings for pupils' complex needs, so schools that can provide for their particular need. Um, do you think that will impact parental choice in a positive way? Is it fair on schools? Um, and what about in areas where there are limited placements? I'm thinking particularly rural areas where there just aren't, there isn't the same density of, of educational provision. Uh, would anybody like to go first? Michael. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to comment on that. I mean, we already look at um, complaints where people come to us, um, particularly in areas, as, as you say, where maybe very large, sparsely populated areas of the country where the range of provision is relatively limited, perhaps. Um, and the local authorities' vision of what provision is available and what provision they're willing to, to consider is actually far, far too constrained. And we already, we already see these problems. Um, and, and any um, step which um, sort of codified that approach, I think, is potentially hugely problematic because one of our one of the sort of tenants of, that we would say to local authorities is the, a key principle and when you're considering somebody needs somebody's needs is you have to consider the specific needs of that individual you can't just pitch and hold them in a in a particular category and say well this is all that's available locally so any step that reduced the local authorities discretion to think about the specific needs of an individual and tie people to a mm -hmm. perhaps a very limited list of provision locally i think would potentially be a very retrograde step okay Thank you. Thank you. Could I, could I come in on that as well? Because yeah. I think we've had a lot from um, this. Is this has been the, the the area of the green paper that's that's created the most concern from parents? Um, really, very very simply, um, the you know they are not convinced that the right school will be on that list for their child. Mm -hmm. Well, so, and then what happens if the right school is not on that list? where do they go what right of redress do they have do they, you know, will they have to go to tribunal <laughs> there's a little bit of softening if the list is created in co-production either with local community groups like parent care forms or local charities or and a little bit of softening in that position if if the list is created individually in a bespoke way for that child in consultation and co-production with that family but the overarching message we're getting from families is huge concern around this proposal. Mm. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to end with um, a couple of questions, if I may. Just going back to what my colleague Tom Hunt raised about the Ofsted um, mm. issue and inspections. And as you know, in our report, we said that Ofsted should be toughened up. Um, just the government say that um, the education and 2019 education inspection framework, so Ofsted say, um, su suggests that the effectiveness of SEND provision features prominently. Um, the EI EIF makes it clear that schools should have an inclusive culture, schools should identify and help pupils who have additional needs or have barriers to learning, drawing on specialist support where necessary to make sure they have a positive experience of learning and achieve the best possible outcomes and inspectors take a rounded view of the quality of education that school provides to its pupils including those with with SEND from the start of schooling to the point when pupils leave. Are you saying that this is uh, in essence words and it's not happening in practice? 
And my second point, just before you answer, and if you can answer it together, is also in our 29 report, we suggested that the um, local government uh, and social care ombudsman should have increased powers to investigate what goes on in the in, in, in the school in the school gates, um, so that uh, people parents would have more of a redress, as well as offering them a helpline um, if they felt that local councils weren't doing their job properly. A helpline to contact the DfE. Um, what do you think about those things, both Ofsted and increasing the powers of the local ombudsman? Um, who would like to start off? Um, shall I start off with you, Ali? Sure, I think in terms of Ofsted, one of the things that I would absolutely like Ofsted to do is to be looking at whether the law is being complied with. So it's not just about experience of, of, of the you know, support that a child or young person is receiving. Are they getting what they're legally entitled to? Is, is their education, health and care plan being translated into actual provision? Is that what, what's, is, that what is being delivered? So I, and I think you know, that's, that's a really important element. I am very, very supportive, and, and Ipsy has publicly supported many times this idea that the local government social care ombudsman should have extended powers to, to look at, at schools. And um, that's absolutely necessary if a focus is going to be on strengthening SEN support, but also making sure that the provision in EHC plans is being delivered on the ground. And Imogen? Thank you. I, I don't think I've anything to add to what Ali said. I entirely agree with what she's what she said on both. But do, do you not? So do you think that what Ofsted has said is not happening in practice? Is, is that yeah, I think saying? that's. I think that's right, and I would I would welcome um, sort of extended powers for them to really um, get under the skin of what is going on uh, with SEN in schools because um, because there are there are some significant deficiencies um, that, that, that 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 we see um, reported to us. Okay. Uh, and um, Michael? Yeah, I don't, don't have any specific comments on Ofsted's work other than to say that we uh, share every decision we make about um, children's services with them to help inform their work. Um, in terms of the extending our powers, as, as I've said a few times in this, um, in this hearing, we absolutely think that would be a simple and cost-effective way of, of increasing uh, transparency and accountability within the system by us being able to look at um, SEN support delivery in schools um, and look at things like off rolling and exclusions, but also look at parental concerns in schools more generally. The Northern Ireland Ombudsman already does that and does that effectively. And we, we've trialled that as a pilot jurisdiction um, over 10 years ago now, and it was, it was successful. So that would be a very simple thing to do. Um, unfortunately, since your recommendations in 2019, um, we've only had two meetings with the department about those proposals, both at our request, and there's been no progress at all in that direction at the moment. So um, okay. certainly we would um, be very willing to engage with the department to talk about how we could extend our work to try and support greater accountability Thank in the you. system. And, and Maroon, in, it, Maroon in a nutshell, please. Uh, um, the the 2019 education inspection framework um, was better than the old one, but doesn't go far enough. Okay. Um, very simply, you know, I think I've already said um, no school can be good or outstanding unless it's good or outstanding at SCND. We'd like that very, very strongly put forward. The other thing that we hear a lot is that Ofsted themselves tell us they don't hear the stories from SCND parents when they're inspecting schools. They hear the stories when they're doing local area inspections. So there's clearly we've got to make sure that parental voices are heard more loudly when offset or inspecting schools. Mm. Okay, thank you. And just all of you, marks out of ten for the um, the green paper. Um, <laughs> marks out. It's quite important, I think. Um, um, I'll just do it. Uh, Imogen first. I'd be probably fairly low in terms of the things it needs to address, two, two, two to three, um, a couple of things we welcome, um, standardisation of the actual EHCP format, additional training for um, uh, SENCOs, but other than that, I think um, th th I, I think what will happen is the kind of fettering of, 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 of choice and discretion for parents and support not based on individualised needs, but on kind of general standard or what is available and I think that um, would be a, as Ali Thank said you. a retrograde step. Thank you. Um, Michael? Um, I, I think Marks mine would 10. be a, I think mine would be a relatively low mark because there's so what many the areas mark? in it. What is the mark out of 10? What would you give? Um, four. Four. Okay. Um, mainly because I think there's so many unanswered questions in there in relation to 
what some of these proposals would mean in practice okay, um, and there's some significant areas which are just right. completely thank you. And so, um, thank you. I'd, I'd, I'd echo Michael and say I'd, I'd go for a four or five simply because there are so many unanswered questions at the moment. Thank you. And Ali? I mean, I think I'd be pushing it to give it any more than a two, to be quite honest. I'm, you know, we are really concerned about the fact that um, the focus is on trying to reduce routes of redress rather than actually tackling unlawful decision making. And, and I just want to pick up on the point that Maruna was making earlier about the national standards and being welcomed, because I can understand that parents would like to see, you know, it to be clear about what their children might be entitled to. But I think if they understood that the reality of these national standards is an absolute dilution of the current legal rights and entitlements around assessment and placement and provision um, and review, that they would have a different view. Okay, um, thank you all of you, um, really appreciate it. Uh, thank you for your time and your expertise and for the help you gave to our previous committee in inquiry on this. We'll, we're going to keep at it. Um, order, order. I wish you all very well. <coughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended.